Hey, hey. hey. Have you ever noticed how um, whenever I announce a plan of some kind, I always say, God willing? Have you noticed that? And uh, the reason for that is, is uh, because it says in James chapter 4, um, um, come now, you who say tomorrow we will go into the city and buy and sell and et cetera. And instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. And uh, Proverbs 16, 9 says, uh, a man pl- uh, man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And uh, the Lord has uh, redirected my plan this week. I have to say that um, uh, I had uh, announced last week that we would start the But Now I See series. And But Now I See that that's going to take us a couple of weeks to get there because even though I'm ready uh, for all of that and have been studying that all summer, Um, I am under the weight of the world with the tumultuous happenings in our uh, country and in our world and on uh, television every day. If you know your Bible at all, the things that Jesus predicted as the signs of his soon return, it's just staggering the rate at which they are rolling out in front of us. And I could not be, I don't think, responsible to my commitment to the Lord and to you and not to draw your attention to these things. So I'm uh, praying for uh, God's wisdom as I try to bring this message to your hearts and everyone who's uh, listening right now uh, on all of our campuses. So I'm going to ask you, if you're not, I understand, really, I really do, if you're not comfortable, you know, being in a little group prayer, uh, you could just kind of bow your head and pray yourself right now. And if you're comfortable taking the hand of the person beside you or getting into a little two or three and praying together, I'd appreciate you praying for me right now as I bring this message in this service. Pray for me to have wisdom in what I say and pray for humble hearts to receive it. This is not an ordinary message, but I do believe it is the message uh, that God has led us to for this week. So let's all pray out loud right now, everyone praying. Come on. And so, Father, we uh, pray together now. We are thankful that you have humbled us and brought us to a place of complete dependence upon you afresh. We are thankful, God, uh, that uh, we are here with our Bibles open and our hearts ready, and I pray for wisdom in the words chosen and for strength for this service and for ready, humble hearts to hear these things as they are faithful to your word. So Holy Spirit, come now and speak to your church and arrest our attention to the day that we are living in. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, open your Bible, if you would, please, to uh, Mark uh, 13. And uh, I have to say, as I said already, that the pace of world events is frankly staggering. Uh, We see uh, the resurgence of Russia, and they're now uh, having a strength uh, this week to announce partnerships in the Middle East with particular uh, countries. Uh, The Syrian refugee crisis uh, seems honestly unprecedented as Uh, People are just hemorrhaging out of there by the hundreds of thousands. Uh, The continuing acts of ISIS and uh, the martyrs uh, that are the result of that, Christians uh, giving their uh, lives for Jesus Christ on uh, TV. Uh, The moral collapse of America and the seeming inability of uh, any uh, leader to raise their voice uh, in objection Um, uh, This week we saw the entire U.S. presidential campaign uh, almost grind to a complete halt as everyone stepped aside uh, for the uh, visit of the Pope, uh, who in just uh, mind-boggling reality was invited uh, to address a joint session of Congress. I guess when you have leaders uh, who think nothing of God, then I guess the separation of church and state becomes irrelevant because they see it as a kind of a non-entity and those lines uh, become blurred. Those who like to watch some of the uh, um, uh, biblical overtones of the movements of the planets and the stars uh, know that tonight is a pretty unusual thing, a fourth blood moon tonight at 10 o'clock. The Bible frequently speaks of the uh, moon turning to blood in uh, apocalyptic contexts. Um, I'm not even always sure what to make of that. Um, 
Uh, I will say that I want to avoid uh, in this message kind of two extremes, and one of them is this sort of uh, crazy, fanciful uh, prophecy, profiteering where sensationalistic preachers prey on people's fear and crank up a frenzy um, that might sell books, but it honestly is kind of more fear-mongering and date-setting and so on that we're obviously not supposed to do according to the Scripture. And this passage that we're in says so. But I also want to avoid the opposite extreme, uh, which is uh, the denial and avoidance of about 20 25% of the entire Bible is prophecy. 25% of the Bible is God going out of his way to confirm the supernatural nature of his word and to draw his own people's attention to their rightly placed confidence in the scriptures. And when you see things that came out of the mouth of the Messiah 2,000 years ago showing up in the newspaper multiple times, not per decade or per year or even per month, but multiple times a week, these things are now uh, right before our eyes well, he gave us these things. He said, when you see these things coming to pass, you will know that the time of my return uh, is very near. So, um, here they come. Ten signs that indicate uh, the last days of human history. This is going to take us two messages, uh, God willing. Uh, this is going to take us two messages to get through, but uh, somebody lift up your voice and say, don't hurry. Don't hurry. Mark 13, 1. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. Well, of course, they were at the temple there in Jerusalem. I've been to it many times. And uh, 37 acres, the most 30, uh, sacred acreage on the planet, three world religions trace their source there, uh, Islam, uh, Judaism, and Christianity. If you've ever been on the Temple Mount, it is so fraught with tension between the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims. It's really unbelievable. But before any of that was happening, Jesus was walking there with the disciples and the beautiful Jerusalem stone with its kind of yellowish, goldish. It was probably uh, uh, glittering in the sunlight. And then the temple, of course, was overlaid in many places with gold. No wonder uh, one of the disciples said, A teacher, what wonderful stones, what wonderful buildings. And Jesus, of course, the same yesterday and today forever, who knows the end from the beginning, the Alpha and Omega, he said, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. <laughs> Talk about a buzzkill, right? And, and the disciples were all fired up. Hey, hey, it's a beautiful day. Look at the beautiful temple. He's like, yeah, all this is going to get leveled. Well, that would, if you know the sacredness of the temple to the Jewish people, and they, they're like, when, you know, and how will we know when it's coming? And so um, they were asking these questions. Verse 3 says, and as he sat on the Mount of Olives, just down through the Kidron Valley and up on the other side, I've preached right there in that place. As he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed, this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. The birth pains. And I know some of you, when you hear a message on prophecy, you're like, well, I think there was some guy in the 1950s that said Jesus was going to come back any day. And I think there was a guy like in the 1980s who said that. And I think there was a, you know, I know all that part. But uh, I purposely didn't ask my wife Kathy this question until now because I think most people would agree. How many, we've had three kids. How many people would agree that the husband and the wife both go through an equal amount of suffering in the delivery of a baby? So more the, ma more, more the ladies, you think? All right, so um, to illustrate that point, uh, I didn't ask my wife this, but how many, I see Landon sitting beside you there, so we'll use him as, him as an example. How many hours of labor was there with Landon? Do you remember, do you know how long? About eight, okay, because I, 
I gotta just say, I mean, you could have said a week, a day, I had no, I just had, I had no sense of that at all. Now, how many people here have either delivered a baby or been in a delivery room when a baby came into this world? Put up your hands if you've had one of those experiences. All right, then, you know this. There could be false alarms for days or even weeks. Am I right? And then something changes. And you're like, I think it's happening. And then you get to the hospital, and it's not as soon as you think. And then you get there, and it gets more, and it gets more, and you want to push, and you can, and you want to push, and you can. And then eventually it's time to push, but it's still not hurting like it's going to. At the very end, the pain is so intense, I'm told. <laughs> that it makes all of the pain up to that point seem like nothing. And the Holy Spirit of God is telling us in the pages of Scripture that the signs of the times are like birth pains. And all I can say is this. It's never hurt this bad before. Never. What if Christ doesn't come back for 50 years or 100 years? I don't know. But I am not wrong to look at what's happening in our world and warn our church. It's never hurt like this before. And so the first sign of the times, there's 10 coming, is this religious deception uh, already mentioned. Now I know that we have converted Catholics in our church and we are glad that you have found a personal relationship with Jesus through faith in him. And I know that we have people who are investigating the gospel who are coming to our church who would still consider themselves or call themselves Roman Catholic. And I understand that Catholicism, like Judaism, has some elements to it that it's like my family. You be careful you don't say nothing about my mom. Be careful you don't say something about my dad. And, and I want to with that sensitivity, also not fail to bring the needed warning. I'm actually looking right now at an article by Judge Andrew Napolitano. It's in Fox News. The article actually is called Why Pope Francis Has Disappointed So Many Roman Catholics. Now, I'm not even going to talk about because I just, I think it's petty. I'm not going to talk about the Pope's economic foolishness. He's the furthest thing from an economist. But he's a Marxist, and he believes in the redistribution of wealth. I don't think you could find a sound economist in the whole world who would say that the answer to poverty is Marxism. Didn't we already do this in the last century? It didn't lead to it's a popular message, but it is not. It's not a biblical message, and it's not even economically sound. And I'm not going to talk about the ecological naivete of some of his apparent disregard for the legitimate differences of opinion in green science. I don't have all this figured out. That's not my career. Some of you here in our church know a great deal more about these matters than me. I'm not going to bring up his assault on the family by simplifying divorce and streamlining the process. We always felt like in spite of our immense doctrinal differences, we had partners in the Catholic Church who believed in the sanctity of marriage like we did. I'm not even going to get into my personal feelings about some of the trappings of humility that seem to me to be so inconsistent with a faster trip to Fifth Avenue in New York City than any pope has ever made, and the parade streets and the waving constantly, there's something in that that does not smack uh, to me of humility. I'm not going to get into the unbiblical morality that embraces uh, different levels of a per perversion, apparently, and rejects the word of God. But let me just say that um, 
Napolitano, a, a, a U.S. Uh, court judge, said this, the Pope has seriously disappointed those who believe the Roman Catholic Church preserves and teaches the truth. I, I don't believe that. But he's disappointed people that do believe that. The truth is Christ is risen and unity with him is Christianity. It's not a debate about minimum wage or the cost of air conditioning. The primary issue with Pope Francis is his, listen to me, is his erasing the lines of world religion, praying with Muslims in Vatican City and reading the Quran together obliterating all distinctions between the truth about Jesus Christ and other satanic forms of world religion. This from the Huffington Post. Pope Francis says, atheists who do good are redeemed. Quote, the Lord created us in his image and likeness and we are in the image of the Lord and he does good and all of us have this commitment at heart. Do good and not evil. All of us. But Father, and he imagines himself praying, this is not Catholic. He cannot do good. Yes, he can. The Lord has redeemed all of us with the blood of Christ, he puts in the mouth of God the Father in this statement. All of us, not just Catholics, everyone. But Father, the atheists, even the atheists, everyone. We must meet one another doing good. But I don't believe, and then he imagines someone saying, but I don't believe... I'm an atheist, Father. And the answer, but do good. We will all meet one another there. Speaking of heaven. Now, that is a staggering departure from an already massively aberrant form of Christianity. And I would have you prayerfully consider if that doesn't cause you a massive problem. If your heart doesn't long for lost people to know the good news about Jesus. If Muslims and atheists and everyone simply by doing good. Simply by doing good? What, what then was the purpose of the cross? What then was the purpose of the atonement? These are the most sacred, treasured things at the center of the Word of God, at the center of Christianity. They're not up for debate. They can't be sl slidden aside uh, um, easily by someone who appears to be attempting some kind of world popularity. And as Christians who are not familiar with the Word of God will resent the insistence that somehow I'm showing up uh, at the wrong time, at a, at, a, at a party that everyone's enjoying, I should be reminded that one of the most common refrains in Scripture, read about the great harlot and the beast in Revelation 17. I preached through every verse of that here in this church. How the great deception and the one world religion is, is a centerpiece of the end of the age. If you had have told me five years ago or ten years ago, that any significant leader within the broadest uh, framework of Christendom would stand up and say that Muslims are going to heaven reading the Quran and that, that, that uh, atheists who just are kind to their neighbor without Jesus are going to end up... That's universalism is all that is. And so to just frame this for us in the clearest way possible, universalism is the teaching that everyone will ultimately be saved. Let me just put up this little chart that I made, and my goal here is clarity. So across the top, you see the gospel. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He rose from the dead. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You'll be saved. That's the gospel. Now, um, that's about as broad as our cooperation can go. But there are people who claim to be Christians who try to take their, let's, you, I'm sure you can't understand, those who want to make it wider and more inclusive, like we've been watching this week, will call those people AWAP, that's as wide as possible. They want to make it as wide as possible. Isn't that clever how I did that with the letters? That's an acronym. <laughs> All right, you can't just get this stuff anywhere. And, 
and that's as wide as possible. And then over on this side, kind of like more my background, do you want to guess what that is? As narrow as possible. Now, we, do, we don't desire narrowness. It, listen, listen. It grieves us. That broad is the road that leads to destruction. And that many people are going that way. I'm reminded of the Scottish theologian when he was asked about the reality of hell. He said, aye, but can you say it without a tear in your eye? And we are not callous or indifferent to the reality that narrow is the road that leads to eternal life and only a few are finding it. So we want to be as wide as biblical, right? As wide as biblical. We used to sing when I was... um, A kid in Bible club, we would sing, wide, wide as the ocean, high as the heavens above, deep, deep as the deepest sea is my Savior's love. I, though so unworthy, still am a child of his care, for his word teaches me that his love reaches me anywhere. And we want to be as wide as we can be. We long to see lost people come in to the family of God and find the forgiveness of sins that they can only find in Jesus Christ. As wide as biblical. But you can't take more than half a step into ecumenical. I was talking to a well-known pastor who was at the White House this week and called what he heard, his exact words to me were, that's universalism. And universalism is the teaching that everyone everywhere, regardless of what they believe, will ultimately find themselves in heaven. If that's the case, I'm going golfing. (laughs) But that is not the case. Over on this side, you get to the other side where it's so separatistic, so narrow, so happily isolated all by ourselves. Us four and no more. And isn't it awesome? We're the only ones that have it. And that's not God's heart. That's not the Jesus that we meet in the scriptures. And so um, let's stay inside those dotted lines under the word of God. Amen. And, 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 and inside the gospel. That's but as wide as biblically possible. Ten signs that indicate the last days of human history. As you can see, I am not going to, nor am I going to attempt to finish this whole message this week we'll finish God willing (laughs) next week number two escalating wars and increased human suffering not because I say so but look at Mark 13 verse 7 here's another sign and when you hear of wars and rumors of wars do not be alarmed Now, we don't hear any rumors in our day, in Jesus' day. kind of, I heard there's something going on somewhere. Now you just turn on the TV and you see it. You actually see it happening. But when Christ wrote this, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Notice, do not be alarmed. Might be good for you to underline some of these exhortations in the passage so you know what the Lord's response, desired response from you is. No one leads you astray. Do not be alarmed. Be on your guard. All of these things are here. But in this particular verse, these wars and rumors of wars. So escalating wars. In the last 100 years, 180 million people have been killed in combat on the face of the earth. That's more than in all previously recorded history as far back as excavation goes. 180 million people in the last 100 years. It's hard not to see that as an escalating sign of the times, but that was preached a decade ago, two decades ago, but it is only becoming more so uh, in our world today. I was reading, I can't call the number to mind, but I read this week how many particular places right now the U.S. is involved in various large and small combat operations in various places around the world. And then what's going on in Russia... um, they're actually what the, the oil reserves that they sold in the 90s to keep themselves uh, afloat. Uh, they're now taking back by force. Uh, Shell oil, for example, is effectively giving uh, Russia 50% of a particular oil field that contains 100, uh, 1.2 billion barrels of oil, 500 billion cubic meters of natural gas, just giving it back because if they don't give it back, it'll be taken by force. 
And of course, they have now, uh, um, some would say, the largest uh, reserves of uh, natural resources in the world. Um, taking back, of course, Crimea, threatening the Ukraine. Uh, if you know the scriptures very well, you know that from the north, um, the, um, Russia figures very prominently in biblical prophecy. And 10 years ago, nobody could figure out. And, but since uh, Putin and 2000, there is this massive, massive resurgence underway that is bringing them back to the forefront again. Uh, in the New York Times this week, um, uh, this headline, the U.S. will accept more refugees as the crisis grows. And uh, there's the headline. Uh, the U.S., um, I mean, this is just, it's right in the papers. Um, the um, escalating wars and increased human suffering. And then this uh, uh, from the uh, Guardian, um, that the refugee crisis is now, uh, what we're seeing, we're saying is the tip of the iceberg. And as, as countless hundreds of thousands, even millions of people are hemorrhaging out of the Middle East, the impact that that's having on Europe and the complete reshaping of the economic condition in Europe, that America is taking people just to keep that thing afloat. I mean, the whole world right now is just heaving like uh, a massive social uh, an economic earthquake is underway. Absolute chaos in Central Africa with despotic rulers, murderous rampages, unpunished raping and pillaging without, honestly, without response. It's almost like everyone just looks away. That can't be fixed. Leave it alone. So these are signs of the soon return of Jesus. Are you seeing them? Yeah. Religious deception, escalating wars and increased human suffering. And then this, believers forced uh, to identify themselves. Believers forced to identify themselves. Uh, look at verse 9, uh, Mark 13, 9. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, legal authorities. And you will be beaten in synagogues, places of worship. And you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. I'll come back to verse 10. Look at verse 11. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to imagine that you uh, left church today and the things that I'm talking about are not nearly as far away as they used to seem. And somehow... Uh, a law was passed and, or an action was taken and, and somehow you were the person now who had to answer, who had to respond, who had to testify. Imagine those uh, people uh, kneeling on the beach in those orange jumpsuits. And the hooded person stands behind them and they can hear the man with the ax coming down the line. And in a moment, it's going to be your turn. And he says, all right. Do you confess Jesus Christ? Yes or no? And you know then, and, and people are like, how would I do? What would I do? What would I do? And what the scripture is saying is you don't need to be anxious about what you would do. Because if you feel in yourself that you wouldn't have the strength to testify to Christ in the moment, you would be surprised in the final second of your life to hear your mouth saying the words that the Holy Spirit is giving you the strength to say. Now, if this seems far-fetched, I'm sure you've been seeing on the news now how the ISIS people are going through the streets. They're actually going out through the streets and uh, marking people's homes uh, with these. Have you seen this? And they're actually marking the homes with this symbol. Uh, that is an N or a noon in Arabic, our English letter N, and it stands for Nasrani, which is... Again, Arabic for Nazarene. And that is the pejorative, a negative, insulting term uh, that Muslims use for us, for Christians. They follow the Nazarene, a diminishment of the person of Christ to his, the city that he grew up in. And you see the disdain in that. But what they're doing is they're taking and they're placing that mark on uh, homes, uh, signaling uh, to... Uh, 
um, rogue brigades that are coming through the streets in the evening, if you want to have a little fun, and they do it all the time, it's happening right now, they go into the house and they murder and rape uh, the people that they find inside the house because they are, like us, followers of Jesus. And if you read a little bit uh, more in the text, or let me even just go to the uh, next uh, point, wholesale defection and betrayal by apostate believers. Verse 12, and brother will deliver brother over to death and father his child and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. Now imagine if your sister was living in your house and she's a Christian and you're not. Imagine if your parents were living in your home and they're Christ followers and you're not. You come home from work and you see that symbol written on the outside of your fence. You know what could be coming today. Well, you can see what's going to happen. They're like, you can't live here no more. All right? We've helped you as much as we can. And brother will turn against brother and put family out into the street. And church family, people, we're not with that. That's too extreme. We're not, gonna, not, not here. We don't want that. And so, I mean, it's all coming down. It is going on right now in the world right now. And all through streets in Iraq and other places in the Middle East. And so now Christians, many Christians around the world are taking this and they're just saying, you know what? I'm going to just have this, I'm just going to have this symbol myself. And I don't, I don't, you know, I think the day has come where it's just not. We used to sing as kids, the answer seemed self-evident. We would sing that little song, you know, this little light of mine. And then, then the verse, hide it under a bushel. And, and, and that kind of sort of, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe that would be best is really the, but I'm telling you, the days are gone. Um, so sad for those who thought that they were making Christianity better by making it easier. Those who think they've improved Christianity by making it easier are going to find their churches empty. Dead religious ritual Christians, those churches are empty. Health, wealth, stupidity, prosperity, Jesus exists to improve my portfolio, Christianity. That's going down hard. Liberal, social, gospel, Christianity, those churches are going to be empty. Self-esteem, psychological, Jesus is my life coach, Christianity, that's going over the falls too. The only thing that's going to be left is the under the authority of Scripture, filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ is the pearl of great price, the treasure for which I have given up everything and found in him all that my heart has been looking for and longing for. Genuine Christ-following people will be given by the Lord the strength to endure what is ahead. Amen. Now, loved ones, these are signs of the times. Religious deception. Do you see it? Escalating wars and increased human suffering. Seems like every night on the news I watch somebody's car riding down the street in a flood. I can remember when I'd never seen that. Now it's like every day. Something's on fire, something's burning to the ground, earthquakes. Believers forced to identify themselves. No more secret Christ following. Wholesale defection and betrayal by apostate believers. Just look at the animosity in our country toward anyone who stands up to the cascading immorality. You can parade perversity through the streets and have police, taxpayers, pay to have you protected. But if you stand up for what's right and signal that you're not okay, as I've said before, the only person who's not okay is the person who won't say that everything's okay. The only thing that doesn't go is the person who won't say everything goes. This is the world we live in. If I'd have said that 15 years ago, people would be like, what are you talking about? Now everyone's nodding their head. Signs that indicate the last days of human history. Signs of the times in the New York Times. Last one, verse 10. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. So how's that going? 
Other gospels say the same thing, that Christ will not return, or that the, once the gospel has been preached to all nations, then you know that the end is near. Now, without getting sidelined a little bit, I'd like to just say that if you preach, has the gospel gone to the whole earth? If you Google that, um, you're going to get really confused. I had two of the smartest people I know help me with this part of the message, and the stack of paper that they sent me, here's why. Even apart from Christianity, what, what are known as ethnologists, people who study various ethnologies, all right, in the world, that's their career, that's their thing, and so they never cease to parse ethnologies. That's a new people group, that's a new people group. Uh, years ago, I went to sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where the Fulani people, millions of them are nomadic people along the base uh, um, in uh, north of Senegal, north of Mali, north of Nigeria, and all the way across over to Egypt, sub-Saharan desert, but ethnologists have the same people. They're not part of any country, they're nomadic. And they speak the same language, but they're divided into every ethnology. Every country is another ethnology. Every, they need their own Bible. They need their own. So as all that ethnology comes into missiology, it just seems like we raise the money to get the gospel to the ends of the earth about every seven years. And I'm not entirely sure what that's spent on. But if you look, it looks like we're falling behind, not getting ahead. And that isn't actually accurate to what the scriptures call for. I understand that the word there translated nations, ethnos, is ethnicities. It certainly doesn't mean, you know, current governmental boundaries. But let me just say this. The gospel has been preached to the ends of the earth. All right? Paul was already saying that in Colossians 1, that the gospel has been heard uh, under all of the heavens. And, and, of course, Titus 2 says that the grace of God which brings salvation has appeared to all men. But that's talking more about general re revealing of God in creation. All of that to say, as it relates to Mark 13, 10, there's nothing missing. We're not waiting on, and, and we're committed to missions, you know, risen for the nations, amen. And we're planting churches all over the world, and we're committed to getting the gospel out. But I'm just saying, as it relates to prophetic fulfillment, there is no further distribution of the gospel necessary for what was prophesied to have been actually true. The gospel has been taken to the ends of the earth. The gospel has been taken everywhere. This sort of parsing of it down into little specifics that would cause anyone to feel a sense of laxity, like, well, I don't need to be concerned about the return of Christ yet. I mean, I can find some place where the gospel hasn't gone yet. You would want to hit delete uh, on that thought. The point being, why would I stop the series that I've been planning all summer? Why would I hold back on what I've been working toward for so long? Because it's so right here, it's so right now, that the message has to be to all of us these are good days to be right with God. These are good days to be right with everybody. If you've got somebody you need to call, if you've got something you need to make right, if there's a forgiveness you need to seek, if there's a sin that you need to shun, if there's a, a, a matter that you need to settle, I would say that you should do it today. Next time, five more signs of the times in the New York Times, but I want to use the minutes that remain for us to focus our attention on the Lord Jesus. So just bow with me in a word of prayer as those who are prepared to serve are coming. Father, we thank you for your word. How clear you've been that your coming is gonna be like a thief in the night and people are going to be caught unaware. But you don't want your people caught unaware. You don't want your people living as though they've got decades when they maybe just have days. And so as we begin to think and reflect, as we begin to search our own hearts. We pray, God, that you would cause us to be very circumspect. Who is it that we have wronged 
and not made right? What is it that I have done or failed to do that I should resolve today? Where have I fallen and not sought your forgiveness? What grace have I shunned in my selfishness that I seek now? Lord, you tell us in your word that your coming is the great hope of the church. Forgive us for clinging to the things of this world as though somehow your return would be great loss when we know that it would be great gain. There's nothing in this world that brings anything that wouldn't pale in the first moment of the glorious eternity that you have in store for those who love you. And so we pray as you've taught us to pray, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Our world needs you so badly. How can it be that you have planned for it to be worse than it is even? How badly we need a righteous judge. How badly we need a faithful king. How badly our world needs your righteous rule. And so we pray for your soon return. And we look for it and we long for it. And we thank you for the signals that you've given us so that we might live in alertness and readiness. Cause that to be true in our church and in our families and in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.